Hey everyone, welcome to this week's vlog. Uh, this is Mo checking in. Um, I have been working on some exams that I'm gonna be taking right before next semester starts so I can start my student teaching. It will be my last semester at Nevada State College pursuing my bachelor's degree in special education. Um, so that's primarily what I've been working on. I've also just been working from home still, um, taking some time to go out and get some fresh air and using this time to just uh, stay balanced and, and plan for the future and, and stay positive. Hi everyone, it's Nayeli. Things have been going really well this week. I haven't really done anything besides do homework, work, and watch Netflix, um, which is totally fine. Um, I haven't been watching anything specifically, just any random movies that I like, and I've been mainly sticking to cartoons, so there's that. <laughs> Hello, this is Lorenzo Luna. Um, quick update on me. I'm doing all right. Still just staying inside with my grandparents. They're doing all right. They're also just staying inside. We haven't really been doing anything. So and all is all is well. It is important to remember the Holocaust and understand what happened during those times because we've seen it so many times, even in America's history, with what we've done to the Native Americans, what we've done to Japanese Americans with internment camps, and what we see time and time again that's why remembering people who survived and who passed is extremely important. Many people are already familiar with the Holocaust and what happened. Unfortunately, there are some people today who still deny that it actually occurred, despite the countless artifacts and evidence that were found after the Holocaust took place. For example, there are several museums, such as the ones in Jerusalem, Paris, and Washington DC in America, that show the lives of many people um, that were taken from this world during the Holocaust, as well as documenting the lives of several survivors that some of which are still here today. But we'll put all this information down in the description below. To understand the events leading up to the Holocaust, and why it happened in the first place, I thought it was important that we talk a little bit about Hitler's life, his early interests in German nationalism, and his patriotism for Germany um, only fueled his fire during the war. In addition to his frustration with the surrendering, he was also very upset and critical of the Treaty of Versailles. The treaty had labeled Germany as the reason for the start of World War I, and it also put lots of restraints and restrictions on Germany. After World War I, Hitler went back to Munich, Germany, and worked as an intelligence officer for their military. He monitored the activities of the German Workers' Party, or the DAP, and this is where he was known to pick up the anti-Semitic and anti-Marxist ideas that ultimately fueled his dictatorship. In September 1919, Hitler joined the German Workers' Party, or the DAP, and he renamed it. It has a long German name, but it was abbreviated for Nazi. He then appropriated the swastika symbol, which before that was actually a symbol of peace. After this, Hitler began making several speeches against many political rivals, Marxists, Jews, and the Treaty of Versailles, which he did not agree with. In 1923, he stormed a meeting that was public, um, including the Bavarian Prime Minister, and he declared that a new government was going to be formed and that a revolution was beginning. He was arrested for treason, at this point and sentenced to nine months in prison. During Hitler's time in prison, he worked on his autobiographical book and political manifesto known as Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. In the first volume, he outlines his anti-Semitic and pro-Aryan views. 
he talks about the betrayal that he felt when Germany surrendered in World War I and his plans to get revenge against France and expand into Russia. The second volume of Mein Kampf was more of a outline plan of how he wanted to get out of prison and immediately rise back into power and organize an army which later became the 300,000 Nazi soldiers that stood behind him. Because many Germans felt displaced after World War I, the book spoke to them. In 1932, Hitler ran for German president against Paul von Hindenburg. He did not win the election, but in order to promote political balance, Paul actually appointed him as chancellor when he won. After this, Hitler formed a de facto legal dictatorship. He helped write the Enabling Act, which gave his cabinet full power for four years and allowed him to deviate from the German constitution. He then was anointed as the Führer, or leader in Germany, and he gained full control of the government's legislative and executive branches. Him and his party worked together to dismantle several other political groups. In 1933, Hitler's Nazi party was officially the only political party in Germany. A day before Hindenburg's death in 1934, they created a law that basically abolished the powers of the president and removed the role completely, combining it with the role of the chancellor, making Hitler the ultimate force and giving him complete power over the entire government and Germany as a whole. Between 1933 and 1939, right before World War II started, Hitler used this time to create over a hundred anti-Semitic laws, excluding Jewish people from public life. This included a national boycott of Jewish businesses in 1933. Eventually, anyone who was Jewish or ultimately non-Aryan was excluded from organizations, employment, and anything that involved them being present in the public eye. At this point, it is clear that Hitler considers Germans superior to any other community or group, um, but he mainly targeted people of the LGBTQ community because they were considered sexually deviant, as well as those with mental and physical disabilities, those who were elderly, frail, or sickly in any way, um, or could not work, were considered unvaluable to society, children as well. 11 million non-combatants were killed during his reign. That included 6 million Jewish people, which was two-thirds of the Jewish population in Europe. Though many people were killed during the mass genocide that occurred, there are several survivors whose lives are honored today. So this topic was extremely hard to research and it's even hard now to talk about it, um, to talk about the people who survived the Holocaust and their stories behind it. People like Elie Wiesel, he was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize and wrote books, did lectures. And one thing he always says is it's hard for him to speak on the dead because he doesn't know if he deserves to claim awards like that for people that have lost their lives in such horrible, horrible times. So it's important to remember all of the people who died, who lost their voice. And it's important to, to remember those who actually survived through it and are able to make us aware and conscious of what happened. When talking about the Holocaust, people immediately think about Anne Frank. Anne Frank is a symbol of resilience and lost innocence in the face of the Holocaust. She was born in 1929 in Frankfurt, Germany. She lived there with her parents, Otto and Edith Frank, and her sister Margot, until Hitler and his Nazi party took over in 1933. Because of the imminent danger Jews were facing, Anne's parents decided that the best thing for their family would be to move to Amsterdam. They stayed at the Netherlands for numerous years, while still facing more and more discrimination due to being Jewish. In 1940, the Netherlands were invaded by the Nazis, and Anne's parents tried to leave to the United States, but were blocked by restrictive immigration policies. As the days passed, 
things were getting worse in Amsterdam. Jews were forbidden from attending schools, shopping at most stores, taking public transportation, they were subject to a curfew, and later on were sent to work in labor camps, which were actually concentration camps. As a result of the increase in violence and a letter from the Nazis stating Marco and sister had to go to work in a labor camp, the Franks decided to go into hiding. They hid in a secret annex right above their father's business. They hid from 1942 to 1944 alongside the Van Pels family and a local dentist. There was a total of eight people living together. But the Frank family was lucky because they had a group of friends who were still living on the outside who periodically brought them food, gave them updates, and kept their secret. For two years, they all lived in constant fear of discovery. In those two years, Anne was able to talk about all sorts of things in her diary, which she had previously gotten on her 13th birthday. Anne's diary is famous today for her writing on what it was like to live during such times. She talked about her relationships with her parents, her views on life, and expressed her desires and dreams for her future. In 1944, the Gestapo, the German secret police under Nazi rule, raided their quarters and they were discovered. Anne and her family were taken to concentration camps. Anne and her big sister Marco were separated from their parents and taken to Camp Bergen-Belsen, where they both died of typhus, an infectious disease caused by insects such as ticks and fleas, in 1945. Anne was just 15 years old. The only Frank family member which survived the war was Anne's father, Otto Frank. He was able to return to Amsterdam and recover some of the belongings which had been left behind in the secret annex. Among those things was Anne's diary. Otto proceeded to read the diary and was quite impressed by her writing and views of herself in the world. In the diary, Otto read that Anne wanted to one day write a book and publish it, so he decided to publish the diary to fulfill her dream. It was first published in the Netherlands in 1947 and came out in the United States in 1952. Anne's diary provided the world with an extraordinary recounting of her life during her life in Amsterdam and was able to express herself in an astonishing way and had a very fine literary ability. The world continues to be inspired by Anne's ability to maintain a sweet and optimistic nature, despite the adversity she and her family were facing. To date, the book has sold more than 30 million copies in 67 languages. The original manuscript was bestowed to the Netherlands Institute for War Documentation, and the secret annex has been turned into a museum, displaying original photographs, her diary, and the rooms in which she and her family inhabited.